just to catch everybody up, uh, make sure we're all up to speed, do you each want to take a moment and explain what real-time features your applications use? Sure. So, uh, Sender, we actually sell the facility to communicate with your customers in real time via voice or SMS. Uh, and we also do that with our users as well from the point of registration through to long-term customers who would uh, send in support requests via SMS. So SendHub puts a business phone on any cell phone in less than a minute, um, and that's obviously real time. For us um, at Postmates, um, the entire delivery process is happening in real time. We deliver stuff to you in under an hour. So for, for you as a user, what you see is like a map that shows you the position of your courier. Um, for our couriers, it's an app that allows them to communicate with the consumers in real time. Um, and it's a lot of push notifications that we use um, to uh, communicate ETAs, for example. I think those are the key things that we do at Postmates. And I think similar to, uh, to Postmates at Uber, Uber is an on-demand private car service, so any city that you happen to be in anywhere, real-time communications from the point of view of seeing where you are on a map, where your driver is on a map, and then ultimately knowing how far away uh, your driver is and when he's actually going to get there. And I think um, similar to that is also the real time on the driver side. Just as much as our clients are looking for where drivers are, we're looking at where our drivers are to manage their supply in real time also. OK, and I think it's pretty self-explanatory, but did you, any of you want to explain a little bit more about why you chose to go the real time route for your products to make it so integral? No. <laughs> Please go ahead. Ash. Sure, so we actually started SendHub in education. The primary reason was that email is becoming obsolete for young adults and youth, and so real-time communication systems are the only mechanisms they use, particularly SMS. And then we realized that this is applicable across multiple different business verticals. Um, so more the market and the mega trends that are going on globally were the things that drove us. Mm, OK. Um, now, I know that uh, we have some SMS, some push notifications, some real-time maps going on. Uh, what do you think, outside of stuff like deliveries or car services, what use cases would make sense for real-time features? Because that's the kind of thing where it can get technologically and financially expensive, and you don't want to just build real-time features for no reason whatsoever. But what are some of the better use cases? Um, what do you think really calls for a real-time feature? So we found that anything time sensitive, it's better, if, it's better if your application is also time sensitive as well. So just to give you an example, I think in, um, with individual doctors like primary care physicians, they suffer about a $200,000 loss each year because 25% of their appointments are no-shows. So if you're doing something like an application in medical services, making sure that you have real-time appointment reminders is crucial because you're going to increase someone's top-line revenue by 30%. Um, I think with Uber, I mean, where it started from is just that it's really hard to get a cab in San Francisco and you don't tend to plan your night out six hours in advance. It's you want to do something, you want to go somewhere, and you want to have the facility to be able to do it. And that's ultimately what Uber is about. And right now we support cars, but I think the, the whole idea of Uber extends to a lot more than just cars. It's, it's an on-demand urban logistics company, and we've done things like ice cream and on-demand mariachi for those of you who are lucky enough to get it. And, you know, we want to keep supporting that kind of thing. On demand mariachi. That was what you said, right? I'm sick now and I have a fever, so it could be. But yeah, no. no. On demand mariachi. There are people out there who would be like, no, right now, I need that shit now. <laughs> okay. I think from our side um, at Postmates, look, we all know that, you know, package tracking, uh, tracking sucks, right? You, you, you get like weird estimates that your iPhone traveled through the entire United States. And, uh, you know, a great feature there that we have is that you actually see where your delivery is, right? So I think that is something where it makes where it makes a lot of sense to have better communication, and it's not something that we could do, but you know, something that probably FedEx should do as well, because um, it would keep all of us better informed uh, where our orders are uh, when we sit at home and wait for them. And I think there's. There's an interesting overlap right now between email and smartphones. When you get your email with a push notification on your smartphone, it's kind of like a hackneyed way to do real time, but you can't count on all of your customers or um, users having that function, can you? I mean, from our side, I think these days you can um, 
rely on it broadly. Um, we only have an IRS app, so it doesn't affect us that much. But we use text messages to let a third party know about ETAs, for example. Mm -hmm. So what you can have is you have a sender, a recipient, and the recipient does not need to have uh, one of our apps. You know, We send them a text message with a tracking link. So it's beautiful for things like that. Obviously, you could send an email here, but Again, you know, I agree on the issue of time sensitivity. You know, people just don't check their emails that frequently. Okay. So I think there's a philosophical difference here. We very much agree that push notifications are certainly powerful, but um, what we've found is that um, the, only, you know, the two apps that people use on their smartphones the most are the browser and the SMS app. So if you want to be in someone's existing workflow, having an SMS integration that's solid is a, is a great way of making sure your users stay in touch and stay engaged for whatever their actions they're taking. Yeah, kind of to add on that point as well, like with Uber, the very the typical use case is you open it up, you look for a car, you got your car. As soon as you know it's dispatched, you put it away, and you don't look at Uber again that often, really. What you're looking for is you're waiting for your SMS to come through because that's how, that's how you know that's where it is. So when you do have these uh, push notifications or SMS, however you're getting the message to your users, how do you signal to them that this message isn't spam necessarily or to the people that they're interacting with, those third parties? How do they know that it's not a spam message? Yeah, for, for on our side, that was definitely something that we, we really had to deal with. And I think in the US, especially as you're using short codes to be able to send these kinds of messages, there's all kinds of, of rules. Some are, some are just arcane and don't make any sense, but all of your, all of your messages have to be prefaced, for example, with, with Uber, right, when you, begin, when you begin there. Now, anybody could start a message with Uber and send it, and that's kind of what it is. But, but some of it is from a pre-education standpoint, like everyone knows A27222 is, is short for Uber. And so like that, when you keep seeing it from the, same, from the same short code, I think it makes a big difference. Now, if it comes from long codes, that's where things really change. Um, because you just don't really know who this person is or what that number is, and there's the same sense of trust that comes to it. Mm -hmm. Fellas? Yeah, I, I think that it's, it's a complex problem. I mean, email is uh, a channel that's open to being abused. Everyone else gets away with it, and so, so can you when you're building your application. It's almost a rational action to spam your users because you'll get some engagement. SMS is not so. The cost is much higher if you send a bad message or a, even an accidental message when you're debugging or something. Um, so we found that you know, we recommend for our users that you opt in and that you're sending messages that are guaranteed. Um, usefulness or utility and you know the way you do that is uh, postmates and uber is a great example if someone knows that something is coming or is waiting for something they're much more likely to be interested in that message i would not recommend using sms for like blind marketing and in fact in the united states it's almost certainly illegal to do that so you'll find yourself in hot water very soon yeah no I, when i was starting out my career i actually worked for an entrepreneur who wanted to do a lot of sms marketing and it was it was terrifying and just Bad, bad news. Um, so yeah, Bastian, did you have any thoughts on that one? No, I, okay. I agree. <laughs> right on, buddy. Let's see. I'm sorry, I have another question for you. Um, OK, so and you briefly touched on this, Mina, but what about when you're doing real-time communications in B2B or internal apps, like the cab drivers for Uber? Uh, I shouldn't say cab drivers. The drivers in Uber have a completely different interface and application and different needs, I guess, than your uh, consumers. Yeah, and we don't want our clients to be thinking about what our drivers are necessarily doing, right? That's not the important thing for our clients. The idea is that <clears throat> you should be able to open up the Uber app and get a car. But in order to keep that running, there's this whole like driver side interface as well. And our operations team internally has a number of different tools that they use to manage this process. Uh, one of them is what we call <clears throat> StarCraft mode. And so what we have is we have a live map um, of where all the drivers are and where the rides are happening and where, where requests are coming from. And so what will happen sometimes is that if we have too many drivers at the airport, and this is just a standard case, right? Like we have too many drivers at the airport and we have a ton of demand in the city, how do we make sure that we can get supply going to where our drivers are? Some of that is, is accomplished by real-time communications in the form of maps in the driver app, but there's also like the really simple expedient of just telling your drivers on mass, hey, there's a lot of demand in the city, head up there. And so that's one of the things that we do a lot of work with is we have kind of like StarCraft mode means like on your map, like highlight a group of drivers and say, send this text to them like, hey, everyone near the airport, ton of demand in the city in Soma, you should probably head up there. And then on the maps, you can kind of see this like real-time cavalry of like cars marching up on 101 into the city. So there's just, there's a whole other like set of, of communications that need to happen in order to keep the client experience just as good as it is. It's, uh, 
It's what Uber has, but we call it God mode. <laughs> it's, it's, pretty much, it's pretty much the same, great set of tools here. Um, one thing that I think is interesting that we discovered, we almost have a Twitter-like interface with our, with our couriers, which is an interesting story if you keep in mind that that's the original idea behind Twitter, um, a better dispatch that lets people interact. So um, I think that's, a, that's an interesting side note. So with SendHub, there's a couple of different things. We have uh, individual users who might have got an account from the company that they work for, and that's their like, work phone. So in that case, we have internal systems for them to com get command and control over their users, and things like uh, text message alerts when one of their users is like spending a lot of money, for example. And then also internally, we have SMS systems that we use in order to make sure that the site is being kept up and that we're testing things in real time. So yeah, I think that the um, as you scale an application, you will find that your internal software suite is equal to, if not better, than your external software suite. And the reason is because your employees and your workforce are just as much of a user of your platform as, uh, as the people that pay you. Mm. Now, we've touched really briefly here and there on the issue of SMS, and I know we have some disagreements on the panel about it, but SMS is just kind of the redheaded stepchild of the technology community, especially the mobile technology community. But I think, um, and I'm just going to say my personal opinion, I think there are still situations where SMS is ideal, especially if you want to have like a really global reach for your application. And Ash, weren't you telling me that, you, that your company has like an astounding amount of SMS users just out there and not on the coast in the middle of the country. Sure, yeah, so I guess there's a couple of different facets to it. So we have an iPhone app and we have a website, um, and, but still 15% of our user base uh, interact entirely with the system via SMS. So they've texted to sign up with us, they have, and then they're using the system just via SMS throughout their entire uh, life cycle with us. Um, and I think that ignoring SMS is a, is a great way of, of making sure that your application is, is limited to the sort of mainstream technology world. I think that if you're looking for the middle of the country or if you're looking for people that aren't in tech, then SMS is an, is an excellent way of getting in touch with them. It would be the same as ignoring email. I don't think anybody here would advocate doing that. And it's a, it's a much more powerful channel. I think the stat that we usually use is 10% of emails are read, 97% of text messages, 80% in the first four minutes. So don't abuse it, but certainly use it. Well, I think you kind of burned Bastion a little bit there because it's just an iPhone app for you guys as well, right? So you would have another argument to make. No, no. I, what I mean is that at this point, you can't place an order via text message, right? You, you can't request a delivery simply because it would be somewhat cumbersome to do that. I mean, you have to type in what you would like to eat. You have to type in where you want us to pick it up. And I think that's, that's, that's one of the problems. I mean, it is a very beautiful communications protocol, right? The great thing is it works on every phone in the world. I mean, operators, uh, network operators all over the world did great effort, you know, to have that as a standard. And, and I think that's very beautiful. So for notifications, for communications, um, communicating with drivers, communicating with customers, I think it's a beautiful thing. For very simple ordering, just, just uh, very simple keywords that you can send to a short code, that's, it's very beautiful. But a, as a long form um, of expressing uh, a function, I don't think um, mm -hmm. we can use it. Do you think SMS has a future? Do you think it's gonna gonna fade away? Do you think feature phones as well are gonna? Oh disappear? no, no! Look what happens to email. That still sticks around, and nobody likes it anymore. So okay. it 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 it's it will like take forever. A zombie, really. <laughs> <laughs> so SMS is the zombie of the technology world. I mean, False. you know, as much as people describe SMS as a redheaded stepchild, and honestly, at times, SMS has been the bane of my life trying to deal with it because you're not, unfortunately, like the biggest problem is you're not in control of it in the same way that you are with push notifications. And a very common question I get from people is, why SMS, why not push, right? And for me, the key difference is it's one way versus two way because Uber actually allows you to interact with it using text messages. You can order via text. You can do all kinds of things via text. You can change the credit card you want to bill. And there's certainly features that are built on top of it, right? And it, it almost, and, and having, you know, I, I have three phones. I carry them around with me all the time. So even with my, and two of them are iPhones. So it's like two iPhones and an Android, and I'll still use the text messaging feature sometimes because it feels fast. There's a, there's a that, that feeling is something that it's really hard to, to replicate in an app, I think, where it's just like you get, an, you get, a, t you get, a, you get a text message and you immediately re reply to it. And it feels instant in a way that just other things don't. Mm. That's, that's a really good point there. Um, <clears throat> yeah, go for it. <laughs> uh, I just wanted to add something. Um, 
make up for why I'm on, on the panel. My first startup in Germany um, actually was a broker for text messages. So what we did is we would buy box hundreds of millions of text messages from, from gateways, uh, from telcos in Asia, in South Africa. Um, and uh, they would be very cheap because what, what would happen is that these telcos wouldn't have a, a roaming agreement with some of the big carriers in, in Europe or in the States, um, simply because the volume has been so, so little. But we're talking about 2004, 2005 is when you know, mobile marketing really came, um, came about. And one of the interesting things is that text messages and we were used as the first vehicle to deliver content. We used them to, 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 to put links in them and you could download your wallpaper or your ringtones. The first ringtones were entirely encoded in text messages. So regardless of where it stands today or all the beautiful apps that we have, that protocol helped spun off a lot of the things that, that, that we're using today and was probably the first step towards like a richer mobile web, a richer experience, whatever you want to call it. Mm. Well, I think this kind of comes back also to the issue of you know, international expansion, which Twilio is kind of all gung-ho about today, if you didn't pick that up. Um, do you think that you have to have SMS features if you're going to build a truly global application? I think it's particularly important if you're going after anyone in the developing world. I think the numbers there are just staggering. It's what there's probably 10% of the world's population is on smartphones, and it's going to take them another five or six years to get even close. If you're if you're making less than a dollar a day, you probably still have a cell phone, but you uh, you probably don't have a smartphone. And I think that if you are serious about targeting them, then uh, that's a that's a big deal. Of course. The flip side of that is that population is notoriously difficult to monetize for obvious reasons. Yeah, I mean, I, I would love it if technologists would build applications that would help people who need help in areas like that. But it's it's really, really rare. And then you come across the ones that do, and they're like very idealistic, and they can't get funding, and it kind of all dies. But they built really great like medical information SMS apps. Um, so yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, there's obviously there's a lot of money that flows in those directions. It's it's easy. To, it's not as easy to target it. So I would say that like SMS is a great basis for communicating with your users on time sensitive information. And you should if you're if you are a global application, then you should certainly consider it there. And, and Twilio is an easy way of just getting that going. Yeah, Bastian, no, nothing. Okay. Well, yeah, you already talked a lot about your. Um, experience with that. Okay, let's talk about uh, some of the more technical aspects. What are the costs of building real-time features for your application, whether you're you know, buying bundles of SMS or you're doing push notifications, um, like in terms of you know, financial costs, infrastructure costs? <laughs> Uh, well, um, I mean, with SMS, obviously, it's a lot more expensive to send an SMS than it is to send a push, no push notification, right? You're talking about like a 100x difference, right? It's like with Twilio, I think it's maybe it's one cent or something like that, which sounds pretty cheap. But then once you start sending them in like mass volumes, it, it certainly goes down. But I, I think the other thing also in terms of a, a cost of real-time communication, it's, it's not just like kind of the, the physical aspect of it, it's that people come to rely on you. And there's an enormous responsibility when milliseconds start to matter, right? Because being, being Uber, being real time, like people are expecting that car to show up. They're expecting a response immediately. And if you don't deliver that, even if you're like two minutes late, that two minutes is valuable to somebody who is trying to get to the airport on time for their flight. So I think that's a huge responsibility in terms of like making sure that you just, you can't go wrong because people are relying on you to get something done. Well, what do you do when you fall down on something like that? I mean, you know, there's, there's technical ways to be able to deal with this, right? Like one of the lessons we've, we've learned the hard way is redundancy is key. And you just have to have backups all the time. You have to have a backup for your backup and a backup for that backup and figure out a way to get around it. And it's, it's, that's, that's the single most important thing you can do, I think, for, on our side. Triple backups. Triple backups. Write that down. <laughs> you writing that down? You got it. OK. Uh, yeah, I, I certainly agree that high availability is a major factor. One of the things that we noticed was that um, real time for users is not the same as real time for a computer. So you don't necessarily need to be uh, sending your message in the same kind of workflow as the user is interacting with it. You don't need to have your web client hit Twilio, wait for a response before you pass them on. So we, uh, at, at, as we've grown to scale, have had to spend a lot of time uh, building queues and worker systems so we can pass messages through, give users instant response on their send, and then you know, wait a couple of seconds before the message actually gets passed on. Most recipients won't notice, uh, but it does make a big difference in terms of 
providing a reliable system that's scalable. Um, so I wouldn't be afraid of costing yourself a couple of seconds here and there, but remember you only have a couple of seconds with email. As I'm sure many of you know, it's you can wait a couple of hours before your emails get sent. You won't get away with that if you're doing large-scale SMS. That's yeah, I think it's interesting. I think we all have uh, similar problems. Um, if I, I can describe one specific one for Postmates. So we do thousands of deliveries in the city, um, and believe it or not, you run very often into situations where the network is spotty. And, and what that means is, uh, it could, could be different circumstances. You were delivering um, a package and we need to run the credit card and there is no network connection. Uh, we are having our customers sign on the iPhone for the delivery and there is no network because you're in an elevator. Downtown is especially spotty. So what that means is, you, that, though, that can be expensive. Those circumstances can be ex expensive if you do not plan for it in the app. Um, in two ways, you want the user flow to continue as if nothing happens, because obviously it's bad behavior to constantly throw an error message at the user or at the courier, who, who probably is less tech savvy than the user. And you wanna make sure that once you restore a network connection again, that you're able to pass this information on. Because ultimately our delivery flow is completely synchronous. So whenever that gets set off, um, that is a challenge and I think that can be very expensive. Um, in our case, as it, not in cost, but expensive for the, for the platform, for the system. Right on. We really have just a few minutes left. I have some general questions I could ask these guys about scaling or working with mobile carriers. But if you guys have questions that are just burning you up, I would love to relay them to our fine guests. Anybody have a question? Yes, sir, in front. Oh, it's OK. Like, you just say it, and then I'll say it. <laughs> Okay, so we are talking again about the replacement SMS apps that are doing the same thing as SMS with different technologies and how that may change the environment for everybody. Yeah, I think it's the same as Facebook versus email. I think that um, you know, email, we've been told email is probably going away for quite some time. And I, I think that the, the elements of sending an asynchronous message to somebody via an electronic means that is based on an address and they don't necessarily get an alert when it gets to you is that's what email is conceptually to the human and that exists in multiple different forms not necessarily on SMTP protocol and that's probably the same with SMS I think WhatsApp and these kind of facilities are great but again you have to have you have to be in network and on the application SMS is the only cross-platform system and I think that makes a big difference and that's the reason why you know we see these archaic systems continually uh, surviving for long periods of time. You know, why would there be any reason that you have cable television? Well, it's, the fact is it's still the best way of getting the content because that's where all the content still lives. Dude, do you know about torrenting? We'll talk later. We'll talk later about that. Well, I think it's interesting. Um, while I appreciate you know, you're taking a defensive stance here, I actually couldn't care less. And, and I think it's quite interesting <laughs> that if people don't want to use text messages anymore, well, then we... We use whatever they want to use, right? That's our job. I mean, uh, we, we deliver you know, packages, food in your city. I couldn't care less what protocol we use. It may be a bit more work. It may be more work to implement several of them. If there is an iChat, if there is, God knows if Blackberry is still around, whatever they're using. But uh, so it doesn't really matter. Whatever the people want to use, I think the job of people that design an application that is used by people um, we should just integrate that. And you know, I, I'm personally not attached to any of these communication forms, period. That's very democratic as a point of view goes. You're very welcome. Mina, any thoughts? No, no, I just, I completely agree oh. with Bastion. You know, it's like, it doesn't matter that the core thing is that it's something that people are getting immediately and they recognize that it relates to something they've done, whether that's SMS or iMessage or whatever. Okay, I saw a hand over here. Yes, way in the back, shout it out. I throw the mic. No.
Okay, so we're talking about uh, getting consumers to adopt SMS and then real-time versus perceived real-time features. And we have time for one person to answer. Mina? Uh, so you, on the Uber side, I mean, we don't require that you have SMS or that you sign up for SMS. If all you ever want to do is just use your iPhone app to be able to use Uber, that's totally fine by us, and we're happy to, to keep doing that. So there's not so much of an issue of getting people to sign up or making them aware that like they can, should use SMS. Um, as far as the second question goes, yeah, it's a, it's a huge issue. You know, like one of the things with short codes that happens is that people like you get spammers into the system, and then once they block up the queues, you get hundreds and hundreds of messages that are queued up, and people don't receive their like their message that says, "Here's where I am, and here's where your driver is." So we just we have to recognize. I think somebody once said to me, "It, it may not be your fault, but it is your problem." And, and that's really what it comes to with with SMS. It's like if you can't rely on SMS, you always have to have a backup and. Whatever that backup happens to be, whether it's push notifications or whether it's in-app messaging or whether it's email or something else, you always, again, just come back to the earlier point, you need redundancy. All right. Well, will you all join me, please, in thanking our wonderful panelists. That was great, very informative. And do enjoy the rest of your time at TwilioCon.